like the Truman Show. We're live to the whole world. <laughs> We're live. We're broadcasting live, undoing the, the guilt of the world, coming into the joy and the love and the happiness. And yeah, we were talking today about uh, all the synchronicities recently and even this morning about this uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono song, Imagine, because as we're coming over, uh, Lynn had her, uh, her phone on uh, shuffle and then Imagine came up with this. Uh, <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris Cornell was singing a version of it right before we walked down just a few minutes ago. Then. There was a message to Francis from, we talked about Imagine and the Beatles and the, the movie Yesterday, which was a real quantum movie. And uh, she got a message about going to her group and they put on the song Imagine and everybody felt the expansion. And so it's all for us. Every symbol, every nuance, every synchronicity, every tiny little thing is for us. And today we thought we, I would give you a really super deep context for everything to make everything super crystal clear. It's pretty radical to the ego, but it, you'll love it. And then it will save thousands of years seemingly in time playing things out. You don't have to go through this karmic loop over and over. And... Uh, Actually, too, when I was just walking down here, the spirit was playing a, song, a little river band song in my mind. Uh, there are so many paths up the mountain. Nobody knows all the ways. There are so many paths up the mountain. And the view from the top is still the same. So today I'm going to talk about the view from the top, that high perspective where everything is all inclusive and everything is working together for good and there's no grievances, there's no judgments. It's just, it's like, imagine like an eagle with the mighty wings of an eagle and just you're going soaring higher and higher to a very high perspective. I talk about bird's eye view. This is like we're going for a, a forgiven world spirit's Single eye, let thine eye be single view of everything, where everything is so peaceful and spectacular. And what I wanted to start with was, I, I talked about yesterday that, that the world was backwards and upside down. And, you know, that can be a little bit like, well, yeah, tell me more. I mean, <laughs> what's it, what does that mean? Some of us are uh, familiar with uh, Lewis Carroll's, you know, book and going down the, the, the rabbit hole in the looking glass and, and what it's like when you go down the rabbit hole. Every, the, the images are all, the proportions are different. Everything seems very, very strange. And so what if our, we could say, everyday normal perception is actually very strange, like it was for Alice, but we become so accustomed to time and to separation that it, we aren't even aware that we've, uh, we've adapted and adjusted to a lie. But we, now we think the lie is normal. Like we, we think separation, differences are normal. Competition is normal. We think the comparison is normal. You know, you think the judgment is normal. In the context of the linear world, I would say it's one big lie. It doesn't have anything to do with eternity. You know, there's nothing in time and space that lasts forever. And, and everything in time and space is broken into pieces. There's people pieces, there's time pieces, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, decades, centuries. You know, everything is in pieces. It's like a fractured or fragmented uh, cosmos. Imagine if, if the Big Bang was just a fracturing of perception into trillions and trillions and zillions of bits and pieces <coughs> and then the, the lie is that you somehow can adapt and adjust to separation and think that that's who you are. <laughs> that you're somehow a separate being apart from the whole, apart from the creator, apart from the light, apart from the source. So what I wanted to start off with today is this idea, most of us were raised, as I said, with Newtonian physics and when we 
grow up, we read about history books, timeline events, you know, there's the past and then the present, the little dot, and then there's the future. And we're accustomed, we're told in our teachings that how it works for the human beings, like light, uh, light rays, the light comes in through your retina and then the image is reversed and then that image is, is fed neurologically to the brain which then interprets it that's a lie, that's all backwards. All of our science is backwards. Everything about time and space is part of the lie. And what I'm going to offer instead of, and of course the sound waves hitting the eardrum and then the neurological impulses that are generated from the eardrum going again to the brain to interpret. We were all taught that. It's all part of science. No, it's actually, there's a mind that fell from grace, that seemed to fall from grace, seemed to fall asleep and forget its eternal reality. And now this sleeping mind has projected the past and the future, the body, and even the way the body seems to function in the dream world, the eyes are actually more like projectors. They're, they're, there's an image-making mechanism in the mind, the sleeping mind, called the ego, and it's generating images, and it's using the body t as part of the projection. The body is a projection, and then the eyes are like little projectors. So we have to start to think of our eyes as projectors instead of receivers. These things, we think they're receivers too, but they're more like a Bose speakers. <laughs> if you've got real good hearing, we'll call them Bose. <laughs> you, know, you go, whoa. When you go to a concert, you go, wow, that was amazing. Well, that was all that orchestra sound was projected from your mind. And, and literally, the mind is generating everything. And that mind that's generating anything, everything, it can seem spectacular, but that's not even the most spectacular part because when you learn to forgive, you start to return to the light in your mind. And now that's really spectacular because that's love. Not romantic love, not love that comes and goes, but divine, eternal love. So, so if we use the projector analogy and the theater analogy, the screen on the projector in the, in the theater is like the projection of the world. And when you go to a theater and you lose awareness of watching a movie and you become engaged in the movie, it's like you're on the screen. Your mind is engaged on the screen, you're so identified with the characters that you're not even aware that you're watching a movie. You, you don't consciously go pay ten, twelve, fifteen dollars to just be aware that you're watching a movie. You're going to get engaged. And that's what happens when the mind falls asleep. It's the ego's designed the screen to have you become so engaged in the images and the idols that you'll forget that you're dreaming it. Because if you started to remember that you're just dreaming this whole thing, then you could change your dream by changing the purpose of the dream from one of hatred, which made the dream, the ego, to one of love or forgiveness, which sees the world in another way. So I said on the first day, I would love to get into quantum. Now we're going to shift. This whole talk is going into quantum. We're leaving Newtonian behind because... Because Newtonian was backwards, it was telling us there was a world external to us, it was determining our fears and making us feel things and even determining our relationships. You know, you hurt my feelings, you make me mad. As children, you know, we are, are acting out this belief in an external world. Somehow saying, you know, if you would just behave and be nice to me, I would be happy. But when you're bad, then that makes me feel bad. So you better stop it. You see how that puts everything out on the world. We're at, we're at the mercy of the images while we're still in Newtonian, while we still think there's an external world. So, Jesus tells us in the Course, he says, do not attempt to force continuity onto time. What does that mean? Well, continuity... We like all of our love songs to talk about forever and everlasting love. I will love you forever. Whitney Houston, I will always love you. You know, always. You see that? Always. We like that always, forever thing. Our hearts go, woo, woo, woo. 
flutter, 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 flutter. I'm in love. I'm, I'm feeling that forever love. But that forever love is continuity. That's whenever we feel like the world's too fragmented. Why do people have to come and go in our lives? Why does everything have to keep changing? Can't ever, anything at all be constant? Can't anything be consistent? Can't anything be continuous? We want continuity. That's what we want in our love relationships. We want continuity. Even when we celebrate, uh, yesterday we were seeing this, this couple that was just, this December 15th, they're going to celebrate their 80th wedding anniversary. It was like 100 and... 105 and 106, and they're celebrating their 80th wedding. And everyone kind of goes, oh, because we can't even fathom being married <laughs> to one person for 80 years. We're just like, whoa, that. <laughs> yeah, my grandparents were married for like 57 years, and we all were like, whoa, but 80, that's just like, you got to be kidding me. But the reason we like that is because of the continuity idea. There's, it's, it's a symbol of continuity. But the continuity cannot be found in form. And Jesus tells us we will never find continuity in time or form. We're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking in the wrong place. We, the kingdom of heaven is within. We must reverse where we're looking for it because... We not only deserve it, but it's our birthright. It's our nature. We were created in a continuity. That's what creation is. That's what eternity is. It's continuous. There's no beginning and end to it. It's just continuous love, continuous joy, continuous happiness. So the ego is the belief in separation from source, separation from God. And in our theater analogy, you might say the ego is like the film that's passing over that strong beam of light and projecting the images. So at first, when I say get off the screen, that is more like what meditation is. When you start to get off the screen, some of us know we like to find a quiet place, a comfortable place, get very relaxed, close our eyes, and, and watch our thoughts and watch our emotions uh, the churning and bubbling of what seems to be our, our sleeping mind that is, even though it, it's not, uh, like Francis was sharing recently, the mind never sleeps. It's very active and it's always powerful, extremely powerful. There's never a time when the mind actually shuts off or goes to sleep. It's extremely powerful. All of our thoughts are given this power and that's how we can generate a cosmos of time and space and all these things because it's the misuse of the power of the mind. It's a miscreation. It's not pure love and light. It's a miscreation. It's, it's image making. It's idolatry um, on a gigantic scale beyond what any of us could imagine. <laughs> and so to come off the screen in the theater is to kind of what meditation is, is to kind of be able to, to start to practice watching as the observer. And we've got a long way to go from there because just a lot of us know that when you practice being the observer or the witness self, you can practice this for years and decades and maybe get a little bit better at it and feel a little more calm. But it's almost like as long as those thoughts and those images are still given any reality, there's not going to be a perfect continuous sense of peace. Even meditators will tell you, uh, like Vipassana meditators have noticed that when they have their little conventions, they come together in Thailand or something and they all compare their notes, that the Vipassana, Vipassana meditators have noticed is that when they get down deeper and deeper and still deeper in the mind, they come to like a wall it's like a wall of darkness. It's a wall of fear that they encounter when they go deep enough. And they're all sharing their notes. Did you hit the wall? Yeah, I hit the wall too. Damn that wall. <laughs> you know, it's like they're comparing their notes. Ooh, the wall. Well, we're going to go beyond the theater now, which is where the meditation practice is, and go back in the projector room. Imagine like 
like your mind was like an aquarium and there's, there's a pump at the bottom of the aquarium that's generating the bubbles, which is the aeration. And, and you're the meditator, so you're getting into the aquarium to watch the bubbles go by and practice just seeing bubbles as bubbles, not jumping in the bubbles <laughs> and thinking you're a bubble <laughs> and thinking you're whatever the thought is, but really it's watching the bubbles. And that's what meditation is, it's watching the bubbles, learning to watch the bubbles with detachment. But there's much more. We're going to the pump. We're going to unplug the pump. What if you could <laughs> unplug the pump and there were no bubbles? It was all just perfectly still with no bubbles at all. Like that old song, FM, no static at all. Steely Dan, no static at all. FM, still. To come into the projector room and to get into the projector is where we go quantum. This is where we really have to change everything that we think we know about this world to go back to the projector room. This is where it gets really fun because you're going to go down and question all the assumptions in the mind now. Every assumption, even the assumptions about time. Time to the human being seems to be linear with a past and a present and future. Time to the sleeping mind seems to have two main segments other than the present moment and it's the past and the future. The past is believed to be already happened, what has already occurred. The future is what has not yet occurred. But both the past and the present, or the, the future, are defenses against the present. So all past thoughts and all future thoughts are actually the same in the sense that they're defenses against the now, like defenses against the holy instant. And that's what all authentic spirituality is saying. Come fully into the present. Let go of all your concerns, all your regrets, all your worries. Let go of everything. Let go of, let go of it all. Because instead of the past being something that has already occurred, it's simply a projection. The past is a projection of a present decision. That's different then we're thinking that there's an actual dark past that's actually happened. Somehow that we have to get off the timeline and escape from what has already occurred. But forgiveness, as Jesus teaches us, you don't forgive anybody or anything for what happened. You have to come back into an experience to see that it never actually happened. It was just a false belief and a decision that you're making right now that is making that projection seem real. So it's not about trying to go back to the past because if it's a projection of a present decision, you want to change that decision. Now there's a beautiful line in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says he defines a decision. He actually defines this decision in the mind. He says a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So this decision that seems to be projecting a past and projecting a future is based on everything that you believe. That's why Buddha had it right. Empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's what Eckhart's teaching. That's what all the sages and avatars and mystics have been teaching. Empty your mind. They're really talking about empty your mind of everything you believe. Because if your mind, if we took a pyramid and we inverted it, so it was an inverted pyramid, and the, the big base is now on the top, the point, the apex, is the present moment, and it's your present decision. So everything that's perceived and believed about time is based on this decision it's based on the conclusions. It's based on what you believe. Your assumptions, your unquestioned assumptions are projecting this holographic uh, universe. And if you come back to the projector room, you start to realize that, as I said yesterday, 
history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. So as long as I'm making decisions that are based on beliefs and unquestioned assumptions, that's what is projecting the past and the future. Time is actually not linear at all. The ego invented linear time and it invented what it calls the past and then its present is this tiny little blip that's in between its invented fictitious past and its fictitious future. So it's trying to make the present be this little point blip of, of powerlessness. Like, oh, you're merciless. You were guilty in the past. The present, the ego says, has no power to help you at all. Can't save the day. The ego is not interested in the power of now at all. It doesn't like that book. <laughs> it's like, oh, please. You know, there, it says you're stuck in the past, you're guilty in the past, the present has no power, and you're going to be guilty in the future. And that's why we have these fire and brimstone ideas of you'll burn in hell because of all the sins that you've committed in the past that you can't stop committing <laughs> in the present and are destined to commit in the future, and God will punish you and you'll burn in hell in the end. It, you know, you, it's not too hard to even see where the fire and brimstone teachings come from because the ego invented time so that you could only conclude fire and brimstone, you know, that somehow God would punish you in the end for all these sins. Actually, God doesn't know of linear time, so the whole thing is a construct designed to keep the mind guilty because without guilt, the ego will cease to seem to exist. It never really existed, but it won't even seem to exist unless you feed it with this guilt. So a closer approximation of talking about time is that everything is happening simultaneous. Many of us have liked, when we read the Seth material, or when we read a lot of teachings, a lot of channeled teachings, they will talk about parallel universes. They will talk about parallel realities. We can say from the course perspective, they're, they're parallel dreams, but they aren't, <laughs> they aren't really parallel realities because truth, spirit, eternity is what reality is. And there's nothing parallel about oneness. It's, uh, you have to have two before you can have parallel. And then there's even multi. It goes beyond parallel when, when it's parallel dreams or parallel universes. It's a plural. What that is telling us is that it's, it's all happening simultaneously. So time, a closer, a, a more accurate picture of time would be that it's simultaneous. There are even quantum physicists like Michael Green that have, when they are asked about the Big Bang, they've actually mapped out the entire Big Bang as if it's like a photograph. And they'll say, and here's where the human race seems to be on the photograph. <laughs> you know, where we seem to be. But the whole thing is like a photograph. It's like one instant that we're told by Jesus has already been corrected. So the, this belief in separation has already been corrected. You don't have to hope that it's going to get corrected in the future. It's already happened. It's like how much desire, how willing am I to accept the correction if, if it has no hold on me now? That's good news. That's what Jesus was teaching. The past has no power over you. You are innocent. Even when, it, like the, the, when he met the woman at the well and he, he said, go, f go fetch your husband. And, and she said, but she said, he seemed to know everything about me and it's because he's, he's got, he can, he's aware of that whole picture. He's aware of all things. And that's why he could just pray. And when he would pray, he only was in touch with innocence. Like when the, the group of men had seemed to catch this woman in the act of adultery and knew that the commandments, you know, had said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Aha, we've caught one who has violated the commandments. So we're going to trap Jesus because he can't talk about love and innocence when the commandments say clearly, you don't do this thing. And she did it. We, we caught her. And so they bring her along, 
you know, he's very calm. He starts drawing in the sand and so everything. And then, you know, he basically is basically going to ask everybody a question. Let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Because there was one present there, the Christ, which is pure spirit, pure love, and would be casting no stones. And everybody else, all the men, dropped their stones. They're ready to stone this woman, because that's according to the law. You know, you break the commandments, you pay the price. They all dropped their stones, and then, and then she said, Lord, what do you have to say of me? And, and he basically said, go your way and sin no more. Stay in the innocence that I'm in with you right now. We are in eternal innocence. We are in the I am presence right now, prior to time. And, and there are no consequences. Whatever you seem to do or not do has no consequences. In God's presence, in God's love, you are innocent. And the only way to do that is to go into that projector room and to go back to the light, to the I am presence. You're not going to be able to perceive yourself as innocent and a time being. Uh, Jesus even says that in the Course. He says, uh, you are guilty in time and innocent in eternity. So he's telling us the difference. No wonder we have to forgive the time because we cannot escape but per perceive ourselves and feel ourselves as guilty if we believe we're in time. But we can't be in eternity and time at the same time because one is eternal and one is temporary. How can you be eternal and temporary at the same time? You can't be both. You have to be one or another and that's what this is about. So that belief that you could separate then is based on the belief in linear time. Now, the miracle shows that that's not true. That's why we have a book called A Course in Miracles. It's teaching us to think miraculously and therefore we will perceive miraculously. Perceive miraculously means we will experience that continuity of the moment. We will see everything and everyone is together. It's like the Imagine song. Imagine all the world living life in peace. Imagine everyone in this experience of peace. That's the unified field. That's the, the quantum field that the scientists have discovered. That is everything is completely, completely connected. And Einstein was on to it, you know, he started to see that time and space were both relative. They weren't absolutes. Humans tend to think of, of time and space more as absolutes, like they're like a creature moving in time and space, and they think of the big picture as time and space, and they think, oh, time and space are absolute, but I'm just a little character that's here for a while and then gone, like all the other characters, just coming and going. Einstein felt and proved that basically time and space were not absolutes, that they were very relative. And you can even see current uh, theories, movies that are all showing this. It's all based on gravity. Like if you happened to be able to transport yourself into a black hole where the gravity is very different, you would experience time and space very differently because time and space are relative and they're connected to gravity. Actually, the quantum field uh, to Einstein and to all the scientists is very mysterious because it's absolutely connected and everything that is perceived through the body and, and through fragmented perception is, is pieces. So, I love it. Einstein, when he found that everything in the cosmos was connected, he came up with this phrase and he called it Spooky action at a distance. Isn't that great? A scientist <laughs> coming towards God, coming towards love and light, and even Einstein. Ooh, spooky. It's spooky action at a distance. Because why? Because everything the scientists had studied Newtonian physics was separate. And when to them, unification was spooky. What do you mean it's all connected? Yipes! 
It's starting to sound like some kind of god or something. <laughs> you know, for a scientist, it could be, ooh, the big G word, ooh, ooh. the big C word. Uh, commitment is just to reach the big G word. <laughs> But the big the, the C is scary because the G is scary too. The big G. We actually have uh, two people from our uh, community. They were driving out towards our monastery, and uh, they were happy, and they were in the car, and it's like a, a an hour and a half drive from from Camas, where we have a two hours from the airport. And they were driving and laughing and talking. It got later, it was dark, and they were driving, driving, and suddenly they looked down, and it was empty. The, the car was right on, on E, on empty. And they were like, okay, we got to pray. We need, we need a gas station. And then they drove another mile, and suddenly on the right appeared a gas station where they had nev- never seen a gas station before, and the name of the gas station was the Big G. <laughs> <laughs> It's all quantum. You pray, you need gas, the big G of all, not Texaco, Exxon, the big G. This is out in Utah, in Mormon land, you know, it's like, what the, what is this? But they rejoiced as they pulled over to get the gasoline for their car. And for me, for years of traveling around, I have all these kind of synchronicities that happen. When I think I need a rest area... There's a rest area. When I think I need a gas station, a, pla- a place to stay, whatever, it all just appears, which is not so magical when you think of it in terms of it's all a projection of your mind. It's just your mind having a need that you believe in, and then that need getting met in the perceptual world. So you know, people say it's a miracle. Well, it's it's actually we are entitled to miracles. We are. We have a very powerful mind, and then when we learn to give it over to God, then these miracles just become natural. Your daily life is just flooded with witnesses and synchronicities and reflections of that love and light. So if we come all the way back, you can start to realize that, that the whole issue in the projector room is this belief in time. Because, And how does that happen? How is it that we see a dualistic world of past and future when it has nothing to do with reality? It's not even a, a good approximation of reality. Reality is oneness, and, and the world of past and future is dualistic. So how do we get from being a pure divine being of perfect love and oneness to perceiving a dualistic world? To believe in the ego is to believe in fear or guilt. To believe in the ego is to believe in separation. And imagine that your mind was created by the source in pure oneness and love. And then you believe something that's completely different than that oneness and love. What that means, a, a sleeping mind is, is a split mind. It still has the light in it. We could call it from Christian terms the Holy Spirit. But now it believes in something else. It believes in love and and something else. It's the and part. And that and is the ego. But that's a split mind. But the mind isn't used to being two. It's used to being one. It was created as one. So this makes an enormous, enormous tension. Jesus says you have no idea of the tension in the mind when you're trying to believe two irreconcilable thought systems. One is a thought system of pure love, and one is a thought system of separation, and you're trying to have both of them and coexist. You believe that they actually can coexist. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said perfect love, what? Cast out fear. It doesn't say perfect love coexists (laughs) with fear. That would be changing the whole thing in a drastic way. It's saying that the darkness, if you bring the darkness to the light, the darkness disappears. It's like even in this room, if you came to this room at night and you walked in the door and you turned on the light, let's say, and we'll assume the building has power, you turn on the light, you're not going to stand there and say, it's going to be a big battle. (laughs) Is the dark going to be able to resist the light? Or when I turn this on, it's going to be light. 
oh, there's, we're not anticipating a battle. When we turn that switch on, we fully expect, <laughs> with power, <laughs> that the room will light up. We don't sit there, oh, big battle, who's going to win? You know, we, we know that when there is light, there is not darkness. And it's the same spiritually. But if we believe in two irre irreconcilable belief systems, thought systems, then that's a, that's a tension that we cannot deal with. You know, it is, we cannot reconcile that, we cannot deal with it, and then we seem to project a world of duality. We're just projecting the split. So that's how the illusion of duality seems to come into play, is because you're still holding on to two thought systems. That's what spiritual awakening is, is realizing that, that the thought system of love is real, and the thought system of ego and fear is not real. And that's why Jesus says nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. There is no longer a split. But that's why we have got to get back into the projector room. Because as long as we're tinkering with the images on the screen, that's just like being believing you're in, in a world of unreal effects. You're in some kind of unreal hallucination or nightmare or fairy tale and it's it, in many ways it is a grim fairy tale some of the early fairy tales were the grim it is quite grim even though we the ego tries to light up parts of it and say it's not all that bad you know we we enjoy fairy tales we think that have a happy ending but what makes us think if we're sleeping and dreaming and believing in irreconcilable thought systems that we would even know what a happy ending is? What, what would that even mean if, if the whole world is a projection of the ego, the whole cosmos, then why would we think we could pick out, well, that's a sweet ending. You know, all those great teachings in India, you know, where they, all these circumstances happen and, oh, we shall see. Remember those? We shall see. Not, not judging it as good or bad, right or wrong. We shall see. We shall see. That's the, what the Course in Miracles workbook is saying. I am determined to see. I am determined to see things differently. It's saying, try to keep an open mind and not judge what you're perceiving, but just to ask to be shown. In, in, in the end, be shown vision. Be shown a way of seeing the world in a, in a completely different way. That's what all spiritual awakening is. So what it means is that Jesus is telling us in the Course, it has never really occurred to you to let go of every scrap of fear in your mind. I like the beginning of that. It has never really occurred to you <laughs> to let go of every scrap of fear in your, line, in your mind. Because if it had occurred to us, we probably would have said, that's, maybe that's important. <laughs> but if it never occurs to us, which means we're so identified with the character, we're just worried about survival of the body and make the world a better place and, and save the ozone and save Mother Nature and do all these things, recycle. We're, <laughs> if we're into recycling, are we really questioning, is it really occurred to us? <laughs> <laughs> that we need to let go of every scrap of fear in our mind if we're concerned about recycling. You see, if we're concerned about plastic, <laughs> then it probably hasn't occurred to us that we need to let go of every scrap of fear in our mind. It probably hasn't even occurred to us that there's somewhere we can go a different direction if we're putting so much care into making the world a better place or into changing the world then we really haven't even got to that point of spiritual awakening where we're starting to re realize the ridiculousness of that. If we're still dealing with issues, political issues, ethnic issues, racial issues, if we're concerned about changing the world in some kind of way, if we're, even if we're concerned about inventing a, a machine that can heal the body, we still must not even have a clue it still must not occur to us that we have to let go of every scrap of fear in our mind. And yet, in the Beatitudes 2,000 years ago, Jesus taught 
Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He didn't say blessed are the pure of body. He didn't say blessed are the pure of environment or, or blessed are the pure of, of family. He said blessed are the pure of heart. He was like telling us, go to the center, go to the core, go to the projector room if you want to be free of these idol images. So in today's lesson, Francis and I got up and we, we heard today's lesson and it was like, wow, what a lesson today. Because inside the lesson, Jesus is saying that you can come to a present decision in which idols and images are no longer part of the fear. And then he says, and the fear is formless. And when you can come to that point of seeing the fear is formless, you will project a future completely unlike the past. In other words, if we can make a decision to, to stop projecting the fear onto the world, onto the form, saying the cancer is fearful, or the tornado is fearful, or the disease is fearful, or the person is fearful, saying, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's Saddam Hussein. Yeah, that's where the fear is. It's over there. Oh, and Hitler. And let's put Mussolini in there and Osama bin Laden. And if, if we quit projecting the fear to the form and we let it be formless, Jesus says, you will have a future completely unlike the past. Because why? You won't be attempting to project it. You have come all the way back into the projector room to that light. And from a place of unified awareness that Muji talks about, unified, the quantum field that all the scientists, the quantum scientists are talking about, the happy dream, the forgiven world that Jesus is talking about in the Course. When you come back to that state of mind, you perceive the world in an entirely different way because it's coming from a unified mind. It's not coming from an unconscious wish to get rid of the darkness. Jesus tells us that's what projection is. It's the attempt to get rid of something that you do not want. Why would we see the fear in the world apart from our mind and believe that the world is external to our mind, which quantum physics is saying that's not possible and what all the mystics are saying too, it's all mind. Why would we attempt to get rid of something when we are willing to look upon it with complete forgiveness? We are willing to realize, oh, I was mistaken in my identity. I was mistaken that there could be two thought systems that were both real. Wow, the love was real all along and the fear was not. And from that healed place in our mind, everything is seen differently. Absolutely everything. Then you're not just trying to heal the relationships because they're projections. You're not trying to heal the body because that's a projection. You're not trying to heal the world even. Isn't it great that you don't have to heal the atmosphere? Isn't it great that pollution, pollution was just a projection? Isn't it great that global warming <laughs> is a projection from an unhealed mind that could be healed in an instant by seeing it was a time issue? It was a, an issue of trying to hold on to fear, a fearful identity, to make ourselves tiny and weak instead of vast <laughs> and, and eternal. That, that every single projected problem all comes back to identity. It all comes back to who am I. Why would someone like Ramana Maharshi, such a, a revered sage in India, why would he say that the pathway to God is just through this idea of, of who am I? Of really watching your mind so closely. It's an amazing pathway to God, but for many people they say, it's a little too steep to give my attention all through the day <laughs> to one question. 
<laughs> I'm a little more preoccupied. <laughs> that photo you showed me. There's a few other images that are getting my attention I there. Like <laughs> <laughs> Stephen says I likes my forms. That that's what makes who am I <laughs> seem to be a very difficult pathway to God. Yet Ramana took that path, and he's like saying to the disciples, "If you want, you can join me <laughs> you know, it's in this pathway." We have a pathway now with A Course in Miracles where Jesus is basically saying, yeah, Holy Spirit, I, we know that you're seeing a projected world and we want to develop a system where you could practice with all the images in your projected world, regardless of whatever you believe you are, wherever you perceive you are, you can practice this course safely with any situation, any place you seem to be in time and space. It doesn't even matter whether you're in this galaxy or not. Imagine you get to be a real good astral projector and you project to another galaxy and Jesus is like, you hear this voice in this very different galaxy. You're doing an Alice in Wonderland with a different galaxy. You project it off to a different galaxy and he's like, okay, here we go. Lesson number one. In this galaxy, nothing I see means anything. <laughs> it's like he's still... Is it like a new course in miracles? No, same course. <laughs> You're in a different aspect of time and space. My course is the same. <laughs> Let's practice this lesson. Let your consciousness look around at all the quarks and, and all the, <laughs> the protons and neutrons and say again, nothing I see means anything. Even if you were in a different galaxy, the course would be the same course. Another thing about the course is Jesus says, this course has everything that you need. So it's a complete package. Isn't that comforting? You know, for me, who had studied so many philosophies and theologies and, and, and sciences and all these things, that uh, the instant the course came to me, I could feel it. And I was just like, like I said, I, I, I have no reason not to awaken now. Because it's such a, 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 a complete package that I, I had all these uh, books on my nightstand and I remember Jesus said, now you can put them away. Put them away? That's like my identity in this world. I'm a, I'm a leave no stone unturned kind of guy. And you're saying, <laughs> put them away. And I, but then when I did put them away, I was like, wow. And he's like, now concentrate on these just. Do the lessons. You don't have to believe in them. Just do them. Just stay with me. And there was, of course, some temptations to go back. But, but, but I read in this. No. Come back here. I've got this course has everything that you need. Relax. And and I got so into it that I have to say I I was so into it that I didn't even read the newspaper. I didn't read comic strips anymore. You know, I just. I didn't read anything else. I just used it as if Jesus was throwing me like a life raft, like I was bobbing up and down, up and under the waves in the ocean, and then he threw a life raft out. And I grabbed hold, and I said, is there anything else? No. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> hold on. This is your, this is your life raft. <laughs> you know. Practice this, and you will see. Just give me the faith that if you practice this and you give everything over to this, you will come into an experience. And so that is our context. When we think we have relationship issues, we have scraps of fear that we have not been willing to expose and release. When we think we have financial issues, scraps of fear that we have not been willing to expose and release. When we think we have issues around food, what we can eat, what we can't eat. I went through experiences recently where I was over in Spain and, and suddenly the body of David just quit eating. I wasn't thinking I'm going to do a fast. I wasn't thinking I will fast for a day or a week or two weeks or whatever. Involuntarily, it just was, it just, the body stopped eating. And then past, well, if you stop eating, you're going to have to go face the, you know, it's some number of days, you're going to have to face this wall of, like, hunger and, and all these, nothing. I just went, 
days and days and days went by, and and I felt a bit like Neo in the when he first goes in the Matrix, you know, where he goes, "Is there my those are the good noodles?" It was like faded memories, and I was just like, so I'd still watch people eating, and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, it's like a past memory." Like, oh yeah, I'm eating. It's like a vague memory. I used to eat, and it was the strangest kind of thing. It's almost like if you've been used to something for so long, day after day, month after month, year after year, that there's a little bit of like a, a sentimentality. Like, oh yeah, chocolate. I used to, I used to like chocolate. I used to, those were the good noodles. You know, it's a, it's a weird. It's like a, a feeling of like you're. It's like you're starting to see that that memories are projections of that present decision too. That they really weren't there and you're really not them and you really weren't any of them but the, the, but the memories are projections of beliefs and thoughts. They aren't these solid like things that you're hoping to escape from. And it starts to be, it starts to get real surreal and real mystical when you start to, to see everything is a projection of a present decision. So that's why the mystics and saints have always said, come, be present, come back into presence, come back into the moment, come back into alignment. We've heard those words, but, but we need a context. That's what this talk this morning is like, giving you the, almost like the mechanics of entering into the present moment you have to go back to that projector room. There, there will be no solution in time and space. There is no human escape from, from it because it's a projection of, of past memories. It, it, you're just deciding upon giving the memory a meaning. And in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, after the fall, memory was an ability that you made up that came after the fall. In eternity, what would memory even mean? Imagine, what does remembering, remembering, what's membering mean? What's remembering? <laughs> you know, there is no remembering in eternity because because there's nothing to call upon again. You're not calling back an experience. But Jesus says, memory was an ability that you made. This was made by the ego. Memory is actually a construct. It's an ability made by the ego after the seeming separation. And he says, you're so accustomed to thinking that memory only pertains to the past. But he said, I can use memory to teach you how to remember the present. So even the ability of memory can be used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help us remember the present. It's like put your full attention and focus on the present moment and you will escape from the projections of the past and the future. Wow! In fact, the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made for the purpose of awakening. In fact, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit uses time to undo your belief in time. The Holy Spirit uses the body as you're undoing the belief in what relationship is. While we believe it's on the timeline, it's guilt-inducing. When we bring it back closer, deeper, deeper, we'll actually go into deep experiences of the light in which the body is, is gone. The body disappears. It was a figment of imagination. But the Holy Spirit uses what the ego made, imagination, to take you beyond imagination to eternal reality. It's like, oh my gosh. It's Once we have this context, we can never ever look upon the world in the same way. We will never see ourselves, we will never see anybody the same way. Yeah. You don't have to back up anymore. You don't have to reverse. And what we really want to do today is we want to take that experience, this context that I'm talking about it, and we want to we want to share so many examples, so many examples that you can relate to. You know how you can relate to the parables 
with Jesus, he would say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and they would say, Rabbi, what do you mean? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We seem to have a lot of evidence for... <laughs> It's something else. It's mysterious. It's gone. It's disappeared. It's not in our awareness. But we have a lot of evidence for that. But you're saying it's at hand. It's here. It's there. It's everywhere. It's another way of looking at the world is what he was really saying. It's, it's in everything. It's just, but it's a new perspective. And so Francis and I were talking this morning. We were saying that uh, we, would, we would take a break after the, <laughs> the context, and then, in case anybody wanted to have a bathroom break, drink and everything, and then we would come back with just sharing experiences that we've gone through where this context has been showing itself to us. Because when we were talking this morning, she was like, wow, the teachings of Jesus 2,000 years ago were so radical, and yet in what we would call contemporary times, the teachings are still the same. Trust. Trust in God for everything. Take no thought for the morrow. Wow. That's the same thing the Course is teaching, you know, where he's the, the promise section about once you've accepted his plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. And he even says, without your effort. He's basically saying, if you have trust, if you put your faith and trust in spirit, everything without exception will be handled for you. The ego goes, but, 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 to that. It's like, just like 2,000 years ago, you know, oh, Rabboni, please, come on. <laughs> it sounds nice, but uh, it's like, you were saying, it's like the ranch book, listen, our society... Our in economics, our, our whole system is, is going to be gone. If what you're saying is true, <laughs> everything we believe in is going to be gone. And you were saying, he's saying, yeah, it'll be better. <laughs> yeah, because at the beginning, I think I remember when, when we started travel and share how radical this is to really give away, you know, everything that you have developed so-called in life and give the life over to to be guided and people ask whether well, no nope, we can't all live like you do if we all live like you do this society wouldn't wouldn't work wouldn't function and and then i was very delighted to to hear that 2000 years ago people asked jesus the very same question and we can't live the same way we can give everything over to seek First, the kingdom of heaven, then all, wait for all else to be given. Then the society wouldn't develop. The social, economic, the technology, the industrial is not going to be the same. And Jesus said, you might be right. I actually won't. It will be better. Because the way that even we're still thinking about this, the horizontal, the linear development of the society as if it is so advanced, it's so good. Jesus says, this is not your home. Something is, this is not your limit. You know, do not think within this frame. Even thinking about the technology, oh, today we have all oh, this internet technology, but we, we have telepathy you know, this is still relied on something as if it is outside of our mind. <laughs> so that's really where we're heading. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, to the ego, it's even some of those lines in that move, in that song, Imagine, that John and Yoko came up with, you know, imagine no possessions. You know, the ego doesn't like that one at all because it's like saying, no, 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 no. That's a baseline for time and space. It's possession, you know, possessing, possessing time. Even when people think about economics or they think about reciprocity or working for a living, which is a very common experience in time and space for human beings, is working for a living. You do things, you get gifts or, or skills, abilities. You do work in exchange for money, and then you buy things with that money, 
that the body seems to need, and there's a, a built-in baseline of reciprocity, which is working for a living. And yet, all of that presumes possession. It's like, what kind of world would it be if there was no possession in relationships, if there was no possession in terms of money, if there was no possession in terms of land? Sounds almost like some of the Native Americans you know, talking about how oh, the land belongs to all of us. It's, the land is sacred. It's, it's all for spirit. It, humans can't possess it. And then, you know, well, we have conquering humans <laughs> that come along and say, yeah, that's a nice idea, but yeah. I got a flag. Yeah. And uh, my flag has, has a country attached to it. And uh, I don't even know about this song, Imagine, Imagine There's No Country. I'm going to plant my flag. What do you think about that? And I want some of your corn. And I think you have some gold, some metal in the ground. And it, if I find it, it's mine, not yours. It's not, it doesn't belong to the universe. It's my, it belongs to mine. I'm a citizen in a country. I, 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 I'm a certain ethnic. I have a culture. You know, I'm this way, and you're that way. And you're different than me. And so this is saying when we come into the state of mind of unified awareness, that all of that was, was an illusion. That there was never ownership of anything. Wayne Dyer used to talk about all of that. He would say things like, don't think of your body as being your own. Think of it as on loan. You're, you got a lease. <laughs> you got a little time lease on this flesh suit that it's just there for a while for your soul for your, and for your mind to go through experiences to know itself. That's all it is. And then you, you take it off. Like you take off a sweater or a jacket. You know, don't call it my. And that's what the whole song Imagine was ab about. You know, no possessions. That's been our experiment, I think, in relationship and living in community because there were like the Essenes and the Apostles and then the Franciscans and then there's Mother Teresa, and there, there have been even communities throughout time that seem to say, let's try to hold a higher ideal. Let's try to go for peace of mind. Let's try to go for forgiveness. Let's go for sharing instead of possessing. When I read the Course, you know, in the early years, I just was like, wow, these ideas are not at all of this realm. Uh, he would say, ideas are strengthened by being given away. And the more you share ideas, the more you strengthen them in your mind, in your awareness. And I always like this Swedenborgian minister, this slender Swedenborgian minister, who his name was Johnny Appleseed, and he would just carry a big pouch of seeds, and he would go around flinging the seeds in joy. And that kind of was like, wow, that's like a role model I could go for. Except instead of physical seeds, what if I was sharing ideas? What if I had a wellspring of ideas, of wonderful, light, joyful, miraculous ideas, and I would just go fling them all over the world. I would just share them all. It was a bit frightening at the beginning because I didn't like to travel, but Jesus, he says, oh, I can take care of that too. But that's where going to 44 countries, flinging these seeds for the last three decades, that's where I think it, it comes more into an actual experience where you actually start to take it on. Ideas are strengthened by being given away. He says, even in this world, when you share a possession, you divide its ownership. Which, you see the divide word comes in. Like, if I was with Stephen and I said, you know, Let's, let's go in partnership and let's buy a, a property or a piece of land down here in Arizona and let's be partners. And, and let's share the purchase of the property. So we'll be co-owners. You divide the ownership. But not with miracles. Miracles, the more you give miracles away, the more you give these ideas, these state of mind away, it increases, it, it, it multiplies through the act of sharing and extending. You don't divide anything. In fact, you don't lose anything. There's more of it through the sharing of it. Ah, but if for the property we share it, there's less of it. If, if you owned it and I said, let's go in halves, then I would ha own half of it and you would own half of it. 
we'd, uh, we'd have less of it by sharing it. And just think about relationships. What if you started to think about that? Like, there's a part in you that knows inside, spiritually, you're whole and complete. And you, you just need to share your wholeness and completion, your love. And the more you share it, it will grow stronger in your awareness. But that's different than our view of relationships. You know, we think, oh, two coming together, each contributes, and then we have a feeling of more when two are, are sharing it. It's like two coming to one. That's even in our uh, wedding uh, ceremony, you know, vows and everything, where the two come together. And What's that song? Man shall leave his father or mother. And th you know, We always have to leave something behind and then try to contribute or build something new. And this is saying, no, no, you already have it all, you already are it all, God created you as everything, and you forgot that you were everything. But if you start sharing your everythingness with everyone you meet, without exception, you're going to remember your everythingness. And so, will they. and so will they. Everyone's included in this. Like, when one awakens, everyone awakens. We don't go home alone. It's not like... I mean, this is another thing we were talking about this morning, where this is the ideal of, of spiritually awakened person. Now let's explore this a little bit, because there's a lot of communities that are based on spiritually awakened persons. If the person, if we go back to the, to the Latin, persona, what we talked about this yesterday, persona is the mask. So if the, the person is a persona, if the person is a mask, spiritually awakened mask, Wait a minute, ego, that sounds a little fishy. A spiritually awakened mask, when the teacher, the spirit has told us, drop the mask. How can I have a spiritually awakened mask if the whole point is to drop the mask? That's the imposter. That's where we get into spiritual ego. We get into all kinds of problems. We've invited all of fear to come and join us if we are going to be wor worshiping a spiritual mask or following a spiritual mask. In the end, the truth is within us and the truth will set us free, but the truth is an experience that Jesus says cannot be described or explained, but only experienced. So this is why there's a couple places in A Course in Miracles where Jesus Christ says in A Course in Miracles, here's the phrase, forgive me your illusions. People have been the most dumbfounded when they reach those passages. They're like, wait a minute, David. Why is Jesus telling me to forgive him? I can see forgiving my aunt, my uncle, my parents, my children, my heredity, my nationality, my ethnicity, but why do I have to forgive Jesus? It's because Jesus, again, is saying, overlook the person of Jesus. Overlook the apostles. Overlook Mary Magdala. Overlook linear time. Come back into the projector room, he's saying again. Don't think of me as a person that lived 2,000 years ago. You're going to have to forgive the historical Jesus as well. You're going to have to forgive all of history to know yourself as the living Christ. He's basically saying, when he says, forgive me your illusions, he's saying there's only one of us. There's always been one of us. In A Course in Miracles, there's one part in the Course where Jesus says, God has one son. He's basically saying, God has one holy child, and it's a spiritual child, and it's all of us. And the masks aren't a part of it. So we started talking because we were talking about spiritual communities and how tempting it is to follow a person. And in the end, following role models only gets you so far. Following leaders only gets you so far. Following persons only gets you so far. Because then it's almost like, remember the Star Wars when Luke is going in his little s spaceship towards the Death Star? Remember Darth Vader and the Death Star? Remember that one? And he's got to go in. But as soon as he gets his 
in his little spaceship in this massive Death Star, what does he hear in his mind? Let go of your instruments. Trust the force. Use the force, Luke. <laughs> we all like that part, you know. We're like, uh-oh. Little Luke is going into that Death Star. We're all watching the movie going, uh-oh, this is tough. It doesn't look good. That is huge. And he's, his mission is to get Obi-Wan has trained him, you know, to go into the Death Star and go all the way in and hit the power plant inside this vast Death Star. And we're scared when he's even just going in. We're like, uh-oh. I don't know if he's going to make it. Luke's a little shaky there. And then the voice comes in, use the force. Don't rely on your instruments to fly the, the plane. Go and go 100% intuitive. Go right into your heart. That's the only way you're going to make a direct hit on the center. Because the center of that Death Star was what? That's the projector room. Again, it was Jesus' is teaching us through the movies, through, <laughs> through all these great movies. He's telling us the same thing, you know. Use your heart. Use your intuition. Put total faith in the Holy Spirit to take you all the way to the atonement, to your realization of your Christ self. So, what do you think? We take a 10-minute break and then we shift gears entirely into practical experiences because, of course, we all have those ifs, ands, and buts. <laughs> Those scraps of fear that are going, that sounds really good, but <laughs> that's what we want to address after the break. <laughs> and for you live streamers, hang in there. Okay, there it is over there. <laughs> okay. We're live. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> beautiful. Well, I think the th beautiful thing about these beautiful ideas we've been sharing is that we can re resonate with them. But, but again, I've always felt that uh, it has to be practical. I mean, I, I never could stay with theologies. I never could stay with theories. I never could stay with ideals. I thought if... You know, they used to say the proof's in the pudding. I have to actually experientially taste what is being pointed to. I have to experience it. And, and then as I have these vast kind of experiences, then whatever is still was in there trying to cling or hang on seemed to be weakened as the experiences grew stronger and stronger and stronger as the ahas became more expansive. And uh, so I feel like, for me, spirituality has to be a synonym to practicality. Admittedly, we all have come from places of lack. So what's practical? When, when you need to put fo food on the table, you do the practical things. When you something is dirty and it's getting to be difficult because <laughs> it's so dirty, <laughs> You have to do the practical things, which involve cleaning. And yet I feel like everything in this world is just a metaphor for what's going on in our mind. We want to have a clean mind. We want to, be, we want to have clarity. We want to feel harmony. We want to feel connected. We want to feel love. We want to feel joy. Not just burst and glimmers, but we want that continuity. We want continuity. We want constancy. In, in our life. And we've talked about purpose, like that we have to come to a purpose, a unifying purpose. Also, Jesus says that uh, two minds with one intent become so strong that what they will becomes the will of God. That's so encouraging. Two minds with one intent become so strong that what they will becomes the will of God. That's like, that's like our, our, our goal for relationships. If we can come together with one intent and just merge in that intent, 
and let that intent spread to the whole universe, then that's what it's all about. Even with the movie Imagine that we just saw, Above Us Only Sky, it was just released in 2018, but it was the filming of and the singing and the writing of the, of the song Imagine that uh, John Lennon put out, but it was over a span of basically 1969 in England where they were recording and collaborating and then the release uh, that came in, I think, 1971 of the song. But there's an interview with Yoko Ono where she says, I really believe that the whole purpose that John and I came together was for this one song. Isn't that beautiful? From a higher perspective, two people being brought together from different parts of the world, two sides of the world, Japan and England, and she as a child had lived through Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the bombs being dropped and, and, and trying to use her imagination to cheer up her little brother who was always happy, but when these nuclear hydrogen bombs were detonated, you know, he just got serious for a moment and he was hungry and there was no food. And she used her imagination to make up a menu that had ice cream on it and all kinds of things and he got happy. And she thought, wow, the imagination in the mind is very powerful. If I can help bring my little brother back to happiness. And then I would say that we're all in that vibe of what can we do what can we share, what can we touch in our hearts that can bring peace to everyone? Not to some, but to everyone. So what Francis and I want to do now is we want to talk about our, our, the way we live, uh, the way we follow guidance, the, the way we put such a priority. Guidance is like the top priority with everything. So, so we ceased to ask those questions of linear time uh, years ago, how? How do I do it? Because we gave ourselves over to devotion to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and to listening and following and living by that guidance and that guidance alone. Letting go of past references, past learning. And uh, we were talking about the parable from the Bible of the, the sower where the, the seed that's sown is the, is the word of God and sometimes it lands among the thorns and the thistles and, and gets plucked out. Sometimes the seed lands on the rock where the, it can't penetrate to grow roots and so the seed passes away. Uh, and really what we'd like to focus on for the good of the whole universe and the good of what we're sharing here is, is our parables of the seed, the word of God, landing on fertile yeah. soil where there was receptivity, where there was willingness, where there was, my way has not worked, but this is too precious uh, to let the seed go to waste. This seed has been implanted in our, in our hearts, in our minds, and it is meant to germinate and it is meant to bear much fruit, much, much fruit. And so we can maybe roll it back to, yeah, just the, be the beginning times of when we first came together and, and uh, I like to do that oftentimes too because Francis had seemed to reach a point of what the world would call pretty successful life in the world, you know, where the world says about economically, and where you're secure in your relationship and secure in the things of the world. Almost like the world would say, if you reach a certain self-concept, it's a vicious world, but if you attain a certain amount of success in terms of what the world would call worldly success, then, the, then there's lots of adulation. Oh, you've done it. You've, you've achieved. You've, you've met the world on the world's terms and you've succeeded. And that's kind of back to that old mentality of, of dream your dreams, follow your dreams, succeed in your dreams, and you're the winner. And actually, so Frances was very much of a winner already in terms of the world when I met her. And yet, even being a winner in the world, there's something niggling and nagging 
uh, that's much deeper, that is not completely satisfied with, with the successes and the meeting the world on the world's terms. There's something that's still off, still not fulfilled, that still undone, needs to be undone or still needs to be addressed. And maybe we start at that point. Well, um, I was just talking to Newton a little bit in the break. Um, I was in Australia. I just finished my MBA degree at the time. And one day, I think I was, I just got hired by this big company in Australia. And one day I was walking um, during lunch break in a nearby park. And I was just ha having this question. I thought, is this where I'm supposed to be for my life? Am I supposed to be here or am I supposed to go back to China? And then I have this question in mind, and I heard a loud voice, audible voice coming from the sky. Stay here. There is something big for you. Wait. And always when I never really talk about it so much because looking back and talking about it almost sounds stupid, like a voice from the sky. But in that moment, it was so natural. It was the most natural thing. I thought I had a question, and the answer came in a very loud, audible voice from above. And in that moment, I had no doubt. I look up. I said, okay. And that was it. it. settled my mind. I stayed and didn't know what was the thing I was waiting for, but I, I was in my mind. I know I was waiting for something. Something is going to happen, come to my life. So many, many things happened. I started my own business. I even came across A Course in Miracles. And every single time I checked within, is this the thing I'm waiting for? seems like it's a destiny, something I'm supposed to, to encounter. The inner answer was always no, not even Course in Miracles. I'm like, what is going to be bigger than A Course in Miracles? So I, yeah, with A Course in Miracles, I was just so passionate. I was in this group. Um, we meet once a week on Mondays, and I feel it was just, I, it's not enough. I want to talk about it all day long, every day. So I started a, another group myself so that I could do it. And from the second meeting, people started came to the group talking about this guy called David Hofmeister from America. And I was like, well, this is a Course in Miracles group. Let's not talk about another teacher. <laughs> Let's <laughs> talk about a self-study and share your miracles, and let me share my miracles. And But it just couldn't stop. So day after day, and then one day, um, this woman in the group told me that David actually is coming to to Australia, and she was hosting him. Can she put up an ad on my website? Because I had a, a, like 150 members online, and then I said, no, I, I don't think so. I need, to, I need to know who he is and really feel the affinity to put an advertisement. So I said, okay, I will go to check his, his gathering out, two-hour gathering in Sydney. And that's where I first met David. I was sitting at the back row, ready to pop out at any moment. Uh, I didn't move for the two hours. It was completely blow my mind because of it was like I've never heard the chorus before because there was such a conviction and such a congruency inside out the message seems to be lived and it's not just be talked about so I that was how I met David and I a year later because David said, came and said oh yeah I have a retreat coming up why don't you come and I no, I'm not ready. So I waited another year. When he came back, I went to his retreat finally. And it was such a big, heart-opening experience. Um, after the retreat, I went back home, and my ex-husband was asking me, what was the experience? And I said, God is real. Lo love is real. And that's all I can say as an atheist. You know, God is real. That's that's what I experienced. But 
I felt at that moment that I don't want to live any other way anymore. Knowing the potential, knowing the experience I had in that seven days, I don't want to go back to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Like, why can't I live like this? That was my question. And, and so I think, yeah, a lot of people s- say that I was really bold because I wrap up my uh, business and, and left Australia. So moved to, to the Living Miracles community in, in Utah. That was the start of, of this whole journey. And that was when I was at the airport leaving Sydney, I suddenly remembered, oh, my God, I'm, I'm supposed to stay here to wait for this thing. <laughs> I'm leaving, but let me just check one more time. Is this what I'm waiting for? And I, I got such a resounding yes. After five years of checking, and there was no, no, no. That moment was a resounding yes. This is what you're waiting for. Go now. And so I, I left with, yeah, no looking back. You know, that was, that was it. But I think for me, um, it was really the, the, the miracle in, in this all is that I really see Jesus is in my life in a way that, you know, the closed mind couldn't see. It's only when I started to choose, okay, I want to live in such a way. I want to live in a miraculous way. I don't want to settle for anything less anymore. And it's in that constant choosing, the mind started to open up to see more and more that, it, wow, I always have lived in miracles. Jesus has always been here with me every single step, even me who was atheist, who had no concept of Jesus and God. Even recently, I started to read a little bit of parables of Jesus, and I'm so passionate. I I started to put out the name of Jesus on my Facebook, and people get so vicious. And I'm like, why? I don't understand. But it was, it's just like, if he can reach me, he can reach absolutely anybody who has a little bit of willingness. So that was the beginning. But I was thinking, you know, really, oh, a call the few choose to listen. But the reason that few choose to listen is because there are a lot of layers of fear and, and darkness that needs to be purified. That's really the fear is the thing that, that's blocking, blocking us to basically say, Yes, yes, I'm willing, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to listen. And I, I would say that that was a moment of, okay, I seem to have a, big, a very big leap in form, but really the leap has, has never really stopped from that point on. Uh, every single day, every single moment is still this kind of leap in mind. Let's, let's leap beyond this way of looking at the past. Let's leap beyond that way of thinking. So it is, you know, the purpose was very, very strong when I left. It was really just wanting to live in that way. And, and with zero idea, I was talking to Newton. It wasn't like something was in the horizon that looks a little better that I can get hold of. It was zero, nothing in the horizon. Like it seemed like I had everything else. I, have, I had everything to let go and nothing in the physical horizon that I can say it will be worth it. But in a way that I thought, you know, reward is in the in the awakening. Let me just go for go for that experience that I had in the retreat. So so that was the very beginning and and what happened in the in the years to follow it was very steadfast mind training and what is the mind training it is really this steadfast practice of listen and follow the spirit's will 
and also see where that I have preference and I have resistance and I don't want to ask. I don't want to pray. I'm scared. It's just a journey of step by step looking. And I would say that I really understand why Jesus came 2,000 years ago, did only three years of teaching. And the rest of his teachings are completely done through demonstration in his attitude. Because that's really where, where you know, it sinks in, in attitude, in the living demonstration. And I would say that 2,000 years ago it was radical. Today it's still radical because he didn't really adjust his teaching to change to the construct of the, the laws and the society 2,000 years ago for it to be accepted. And he does not shift it to change to fit in the mode right now. It is completely beyond. And so when when I came together with David, it's just to be able to watch someone like a demonstration, that was very, very profound for me because there's so much you can think, take in in words. And then you watch in the attitude, what does that mean to live in a state that there is no fear? What would you do if you don't have fear? How do you make decisions? What are the decisions that are made from a state of mind that is beyond fear? This this is amazing. But I just give you one concrete example because yesterday we watched uh, the movie Take Me Home. And I was watching the movie with you all for the maybe 600 times. And... And I was thinking, I was watching it for 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 almost like for the first time. I started to see, wow, how many layers are operating all at once? Because there was a thirty-day mystery school, tabula rasa mystery school, which we didn't talk too much before the movie. I hope you got it. There is a retreat setting going on 30 day in the monastery where we invite people about 20 people from around the world to come to have a living experience of what it feels like to live completely spontaneously completely with the spirit um, listen and follow so that was a con- con- context there and the mystery school has its own uh, little team they they had their praying day by day of what the program going to be. They don't have a plan. So everything is operating based on the same principle. We do not plan because we trust the plan will be given to us in the moment. And we, are, we want to reinforce that trust by trusting. You can never develop that trust by talking about trusting. You have to really trust in the moment. So that's what the mystery school the team facilitating the mystery school were doing. We invite the people in, then the team, were, they, they came together every day to pray, what's your plan? They don't know the, the 20 individual people who come here for healing. They don't know their individual issues, but they trust the, the one who brought them know. So every morning there's a mystery school program going on, they're p- praying. There is a movie team going on. We're praying separately every morning, 6 o'clock or 7 in the morning. We were praying, what do we film today? What, what is the, the notes that I take down just by listen and follow and praying? And there, there's another um, element. All the 20 participants who came, they're also in prayer about, I want to listen, I want to follow, I want to solve the problems in my own mind. So there's so many things that's going on at the same time, and nobody individually has the big picture. But through everybody tuning into this one purpose, absolutely everything flow together like a dance. How it all flow together? David, for example, two weeks, I think, before the mystery school, he heard we to invite Nada Bowen, that... Uh, lady who was doing the voice liberation she she is someone who contacted David when we were doing a tour in Europe in 2014 I believe just 
text David out of the bushy when the voice for Holland, which I don't know is the equivalent of American Idol or something like those kind of context. So she's she just won. She's the first great singer, very very acclaimed, basically a household name in Holland because of that context. And yet she wrote to David because she picked up the chorus and all of a sudden all these chorus songs started to come through her. She couldn't stop the channeling one after the next, one after the next, and there's fear because of the language. It was Christian language and her identity was not anything like that at the time. So so she wrote to you and you called her straight away. And um, and then before the mystery school, that's three years after, David felt the, the, the prompt to to invite Nada to come. So Nada came, never never done a voice liberation in her life before. And so nobody we, like we're all so clueless of really the bigger divine plan, but we don't really attempt to know from the perspective of who know the beginning and the end and everything in between. We were just like, okay, invite. And Netta came. So we, we, we have this, this amazing singer available, and she said, I can probably do with liber- liberation, which she studied for two years with a teacher, but never done anything like that. And then when she started in the retreat, she said, I, I I throw all my skills and past experiences and all my learning away because this is this is a crowd I've never had before and I'm just there praying to Jesus, you show me and Jesus comes through. Tell her what to say, what to sing, what to invite, how to basically facilitate one session after the next, after the next. She was the 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 main one that was blown away completely because she knew she didn't do it and everybody else were thinking wow she is probably so experienced but even just just la- uh, three, two months ago when I was in Holland she was there she said I, I have to tell you I never done one before that moment you know so that's but from that point on she completely took a turn because she was this acclaimed singer you know, she has a band, she goes on to television, and then all of a sudden Jesus started to say, I have a much bigger function for you. you I'm going to use your voice for healing. And she just suddenly opened up another path for her to listen and follow and use her skills for, for this voice liberation workshops she's doing around the world now after after that moment that you just witnessed. So that was just one example, like we call collaborator and but this is this example is is like it applies almost to absolutely every single one on the film team and who came to the Tabula Rasa Mystery School absolutely every single one was like that kind of miraculous story so yeah I don't know whether I, I can just think of any but there are just so many to the point that in the end, I just thought, really seriously, there is no chance encounters. Every single encounter is brought together by Jesus, and it's for something so huge. You know, we really do not want to tune down our calling and our light in that encounter. Just like John and, and Yoko, you know, whatever the world can say what they come together for, is personal, is this and this, but they know what they came together for. It's so huge. It's so big, you know. So I feel like when we come for that purpose, for Jesus, when, when, the, when the mind is just so giving, you know, seek first the kingdom of heaven and not really worry about anything else, then you open up to to have this attitude to inclusiveness. Everybody can be a collaborator. Then whoever the name you hear, you invite. And and it's such a blessing to absolutely everybody. Absolutely everybody. This 
this um, cinematographer you you guys saw, he is the old old guy, older guy in the film who doesn't speak a word of English. He's Portuguese. He is so acclaimed in Portugal. Last year, he just won the best cinematographer of this Sofia Award, which is like an equivalent of Oscar um, in America. It was so acclaimed. And how do we even get him? Because his son, Raphael, actually contacted us a few years ago wanting to come to the mystery school, uh, wanting to come to the monastery because he started to lose some f- five senses, like his bodily sense, and he he wants some kind of miracle. You know, through the change of mind, through mind training. So he came, first he couldn't even look at a screen or listen to any audio, like it was very intense, but gradually just by giving his mind completely to the f- to the focus, um, to the projects that are given by the spirit. Yeah, he is. He had a miraculous shift. Then he went back home, and then we got a, a, a vol- I mean, we got an application for the mystery school from Raphael to say he wants to come to the mystery school, and we were like, "Oh, isn't Raphael's father this amazing cinematographer?" So let's call him and see whether that can be a possibility. So we called him and said, you want to come to the mystery school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about your father? Because we're going to have this film project. He said, funny you ask, because my father marked his whole month of May empty, because he is so busy. Like He's still working now in his 80s, because he heard to, to go in silence for a month. So we said, okay, we get them the ticket. Then we realized it was another Raphael who applied. The mystery school, we called the wrong Raphael. But (laughs) but it doesn't matter because they came. It was like, it doesn't matter because Jesus has a way to... To send the people, that's, you know, that's exactly why after six years of waiting, I know without a shadow of doubt, this is the time. Because people come, you know, not through like a striving, I need to make this happen, we have to have a film, we want to have a message, to, to have a message to share. No, it, it really does not come from any of it. It's like Jesus says, the time has come. Is this month, I arrange the context, I arrange the location, and I send the people. So you just get ready and let's go. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's like from the human perspective, it seems like a vast cosmos. It's a vast world. There's, there's so many layers and levels. It's extremely complex. And just navigating yourself through time and space as a human being seems to be an enormous task. You're faced with many difficulties every day, a whole set of problems. You maybe can tackle a few of them. Then the next day, you've got another set. Even if you've handled all of them, you get a whole set the next day and the next day. And we get accustomed to this as a stressful human condition. Meanwhile, that's not what's happening at all. I call it J.C. Central. There's J.C. Central casting. is way back in the mind. And Jesus is literally arranging time and space. And you don't even begin to understand what that means. You know, how many of us grew up in a, at, at the dinner table talking to our parents? Like, hey, I want to I be a miracle worker when I grow up like Jesus. Yeah, uh, okay, let's just be a little more practical than that. Uh, you can be anything you want to be, but... Just not that. I mean, that's just like, come on, back, get back on the planet Earth here. Uh, but I have a feeling that if I'm just a miracle worker for Jesus, he'll arrange time and space for me. I don't have to get good grades. I don't have to get into college. I don't even re- actually need education. I just need divine guidance and prayer and everything. Well, where did you, did they tell you that in Bible school? I'm going to call that church up. You know, I mean, I, I support the church, but I mean, that's getting ridiculous. We don't really understand until we get into the listen and follow that there is central casting, casting all the characters. 
And so that's what the last 30 years has been for me. I just go around the world over and over and over. I meet all these people. I get these intuitive feelings about call so-and-so, invite so-and-so. Jesus tells me that he wants his Course in Miracles in South America, uh, but it's too expensive shipping it all the way from the United States. So I go down there. I meet a businessman in Bogota, Colombia. I said, I think we're supposed to get the course printed it, so people can afford it down here because Jesus is telling us these ex-Catholics, basically c people that are really devoted to Jesus, but they don't have their, their finances, the currency is much weaker, the pesos. So I joined with him after two years. We, he says, here's the book. We got it printed on Bible paper, thin Bible paper. It's a little smaller, easier to carry, not three big heavy books or... It's just that. And then distributed all over South America. So it's not like you just sit in your house and you pray for miracles. There, it's like the body is like a, a marionette. And you can either give the marionette over to the ego, the fearful thought system, which will bring a lot of stress in the mind. The ego uses the body for pride, things like fame, recognition, Pleasure and attack. Jesus, ego never tells you that when you use the body to seek for pleasure, you also are bound to pain. Because pleasure and pain are part of that dualistic system where you think, ooh la la, I'm just going to maximize my pleasure and then who knows what comes next. Maybe I die. Well, the ego doesn't tell you that it, when you use the body to seek for pleasure, you bring painful experiences. You draw the, the opposite. The ego invented the pleasure to keep you tricked and enamored with the world to think you can find a haven in the guilt, you know, and make a pretty good life and then s take your chances with an afterlife or whatever comes next. Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Not going to work. Won't get you, won't set you free. Uh, pride, pleasure, and attack. Of course, when you use verbally, physically, when you use the body for war to attack, to kill, to harm, to maim, or whatever, that's just reinforcing guilt in the mind. But when you give the body, the marionette, over to the spirit and say, use it for your purposes, the spirit will use it just as a means of communication, to heal, to bless, to laugh through, to hug through, to smile through. We know how that feels when you feel connected and you feel like you're part of a greater purpose and you feel in alignment with your source, then in that sense the, the body will be used like a marionette for as long as it's needed for the mind to realize its spirit, its unified spirit. And then the body, the marionette can be set aside at that point. So for me, when I got into this devotion, then it wasn't I just, the body was just sitting on the side. It was like the marionette got used to speak the word of God in many cultures, many countries, many places, over many, many years. All for me. Jesus is like, just remember one thing. It's always your lesson. It's never anybody else's lesson. <laughs> you never have to say, this is your lesson. Listen up. No. Jesus is like, oh, no. For, no it's, it's your lesson. It's always your own lesson in forgiveness. You never actually really teaching anybody anything. You're just letting the miracles come through to cleanse your mind to come back into alignment with the will of God, to, to, to know God's will for happiness, for perfect happiness. That's the simplicity of it. So what we've discovered, though, is it's amazing with the central casting because Everywhere we go, I mean, I've been active actually on six continents, and every continent I go, it's almost like to me going to a new planet. I go to continents where I don't speak the language, I don't know the customs, I don't, I don't know the currency, I don't know their perception of time. You know, the perception of time in Switzerland uh, is typically a little different than in Mexico. <laughs> You know, we just came from Mexico. In Switzerland, everything's precise. And three, two, one, and there's the train. Uh, in Mexico, it's manana, manana, manana. Nobody cares. Isn't it late? What is, manana, manana. You know, they, they, they don't even have a word for t tomorrow. It's manana, manana. When will my shoe be fixed? When will my sandal be fixed? Manana, manana, manana. 
Will it be ready on Tuesday? Manana, manana. You know, they don't care. Happy, happy, but they've got a whole different perception of time. The funny thing is when we go to all these different places, cultures, meet all these people, we don't need to know. Jesus is like, just like in the Matrix, you know, I, I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. Don't think that there's a problem. I will handle it. Don't think that there's something you have to learn. I will show you. Don't rely on your past learning at all. I had 10 years of university. I had undergrad. I had graduate school. I had learned all these concepts, and Jesus is like, ah, we've got a lot of work to do. You're going to have to unlearn all of it now. <laughs> Absolutely everything you've ever learned from the past in order to come to that present decision that we're talking about. And you, we do it through guidance. So we were guided together. In fact, all of our relationships have been through, come through this guidance. Everything we do, every workshop, every retreat, ever, every, I mean, I would do like six week retreats uh, on this island in, off of Spain, on Mallorca, and people would go through so many transformations and so many miracles over the six weeks of living together with me that I have to say the fun part for me was showing movies every night. I would show all these <laughs> all these me metaphysical quantum movies with all this commentary and I would never know even what the movie of the night was. I'd, they'd ask me before dinner, I'd say, I have no idea. We, let's just enjoy the meal and see what what's shown. And the film team's like, yeah, well, we have to set up the projector and put the, get the movie in there. So when you get that dessert done, we're watching that plate. <laughs> you better, when you finish that last piece of pie, we better know what the movie is because we've got to set it up. So typically, I would show it every night. But then people would go through such transformations of living together, letting go of their own past concepts and roles and beliefs, and then in the end, going into one woman... Came, uh, had been diagnosed with cancer. Ah, six weeks with me, watching movies, she was in remission. Uh, it didn't really matter what the problem, the presenting problem was, the freedom came in, let's all join together and listen and follow. I think it is also just stepping stepping back and let him the lead the way together because if if I knew this is the way we're going to live together basically no plan for anything even a big retreat a big retreat for people who come with all kinds of problems and we're the one who invite them to come for the retreat zero plan film the retreat zero plan it's going to be chaos according to the ego it's going to be the chaos because we have to control if there is no control, if there is no conscious control, it's chaos. That's to the ego. Everything will fall apart. But what I see is everything comes to get together so miraculously for such a deeper purpose that is beyond anybody's understanding. Because when the uh, Francis the cook in the movie, you s you see what happened with her, when the mistress cook, because she, she came to, to help with the kitchen team, when the mistress school team prayed for that role to shift, they had no idea of what her prayer was. They had no idea, actually, she was in physical pain, could hardly stand. Nobody knew that. It was just a pray, receive. Does that make any sense? Not really, but we trust that it serves a purpose that really beyond the logical thinking of this world because our aim is not to produce a good meal. And I, if anything I learned here is that the, 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 the result at the physical level is really not that valued. If we have no meal for that day, that's fine, totally fine from the <coughs> planners. They don't really, they're not going to stress about it. So then it's later on, it's, oh, actually, for me, when I was editing it, I realized she was talking to other people about her pain. She could not stand for a long time in the kitchen. It was too much. 
then I, I realized she had this prayer at the very beginning. But I know for a fact nobody else knew. But through prayer, there is a divine order. I really see there is a divine order. The divine order is serving everybody's best interest in much a higher way. It serves something that's beyond the end result of this of this realm. It really does, you know. So I feel like that's exactly what we feel like it, the, the essence of the course. You know, you, David used the example of um, the Truman Show and Sylvia came to the set. And if, if she made it to the set, what is her, her goal in the set? Is she telling Truman, I hope your script can be modified so that you actually has a better script and better life in the show? No, she, she is not interested in the script of the show. She's like, a, come out. Come out and be, be free. It doesn't matter whether the script goes whichever direction, it's still not freedom. So it's the same, you know, A Course in Miracles and, and Jesus is pointing us to a way of thinking that truly set us free. And the freedom is actually not in the future because I feel like on the spiritual um, practice, like David talked about, there is a self-concept that it can gra gradually be developed by the ego. When I'm going to wake up, when I am going to wake up, and that is a future goal. If I do this work, I hope it's not going to be too far in the future, I will wake up. But the reward is in the future. The question is how, f how soon, you know. But the reward is right now. That's, that's the good news. Actually, in today's lesson, Jesus said the future will be extension of the present moment. So however you live this present moment, if you have to think about the linear way, if you have to think about the future, then think of it as nothing but extension of the present moment. So what we do in this present moment in terms of thinking matters, matters so much. So if we give our mind to such a high divine order and divine law and divine teaching, this is what we focus on, just give the mind over, then you see your life probably will shift, probably will, will be, you know, in a way that is fear-free, fear fearless, more and more open, and more and more inclusive in attitude. You're not afraid to, to, to only collaborate. You don't have to just collaborate with the ones in your workplace or in your family. You actually start to see You know, Jesus, whatever you want me to perform miracles. Because Jesus does send the people left and right. It's like a convincing. Like, you know, at the beginning, I'm like thinking, I'm just used to traveling around by car in the United States and Canada. I never took flights. And I just was traveling around. And, I mean, at the very beginning, I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to travel and And Jesus was like, well, we're going to, you have this amount of money. It was a few thousand dollars, or whatever. And he took me to a, a car dealership, a used car. I found a three-cylinder little gold, tiny little three-cylinder car. Back in the days when it was like 80, 90 cents a gallon, <laughs> I, I felt like I could go on fumes. I, I seemed to drive this car across states and states and states and states. On one Philip, and, and Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, I told you I'd take care of things. Now just go and shine your light, and I'll tell you where to go, what to, what to do, who to see. I'll, I'll put the words in your mouth. You really don't have to worry about a single thing. So that's how these long five-and-a-half-week trips, six-week trips, it was all driving, driving, driving. And then... This started in the 90s, and it was rolling through the 90s and into the 2000s. And then I was, a friend of mine, Resta, who received like 270 songs from the angels with two and three-part harmonies. She, 
she received so much music from the angels. It was an entirely new pathway to God just through music because it was all the teachings of the Course, but the angels were using it through the music and harmonies. She started to, she bought programs on her computer that Apple had to to record the harmonies and layer her voice like Enya. And so we were just blown away. That was just from Resta and I joining. An entire pathway to God came just from our joining and her receiving these songs from the angels, recording them. Then she would travel around with me. I'd go to a course group. I'd be talking to the group. Resta would get up, go in the back bedroom of the house, and then she'd miss the whole talk I'd give. Jesus would give a talk through me. She'd go back. The angels would record a theme song for the talk that I was just giving in progress. She would come back with her guitar at the end of the gathering, play the thing, and everyone would go, that's just what we talked about for the last two hours. She said, yeah, I know. The angels were giving me the song, the lyrics, and everything. It was like channeling songs right at the specific gatherings that were, we would all just be like, or we would pass around the little dessert box of sayings and go around 25 people and it would be like a summary of everything we talked about it was in the dessert cards, just picking out so-called randomly. Jesus was orchestrating time and space. So then I went with Resta on a trip um, and uh, we went to Indianapolis and... Um, we had a, there was so many mystical experiences and lessons, but ultimately I met this man whose name was David, who said, "Let's take a walk." It was winter time. We walked. It was like January. We were walking through the woods on a park, and he said, "You need to take this to other countries." And I said, "Oh," and he said, "You need to take this." I, I said, "Do you have any like any countries in mind?" Uh, you know, it's a lot of countries. And I'm just going around like Peace Pilgrim, except Peace Pilgrim walked it. I was going around in a three little three-cylinder car. He said, Argentina. And I said, well, I, I, have, I think I need a thingamajiggy to go to uh, Argentina. And he said, passport, David. It's called a passport. <laughs> Talk about clueless. You know, I'm like, because I, I said, okay, well, what do you need for a passport? He said, well, you need a birth certificate and you usually do it through the post office. And, well, maybe you should expedite it. Cause, and then I said, but, uh, yeah, Argentina seems a bit far away. I don't know how I'd get down there. He said, well, actually, I tra- I'm a world traveler and a businessman, so I go all over the world. I travel to South America a lot. That's why I'm saying Argentina. And he said, I actually entered a contest for frequent flyer miles. And if you stay at the certain hotels, stay at the certain restaurants, you play the game, it's a contest. There's like, there's three or four different prize levels and the top prize is one million frequent flyer miles on on Spanish, you know, Air Europa, or not Air Europa, but that's one of them, and Grupo Taco and Taca and different ones in South America. And he said, I won the prize. I have. I said, well, you have a million frequent flyer miles? And he said, yeah. And I'll fly you down there. I'll fly me down there. You pick two more people, and we'll fly down there. So I'm like thinking, okay, I, better, I got my cell phone out when we got back. I called my mother up in Cincinnati and said, do I have a, is there a birth certificate around? <laughs> I think I need to get a passport because this is happening fast. I mean, I wasn't even thinking of a trip to Argentina, but JC Central had other ideas. So we fly down there, business class, called Ejecutiva, business class, drinking wine, and I'm just like, I'm not a flyer. So I'm now I'm going, jumping into Ejecutiva. I'm business class with my friends, all going down there, and then when I get to Buenos Aires, it's a city of over 15 million people that speak Spanish. And Resta, my friend, she's saying, that's, that's a big problem, David. You've got a big problem. I said, I don't, I'm not experiencing anything as a problem. She, what are you talking about? She said, you speak English, they speak Spanish. That's a language problem. You may have flying down there and drinking wine, but when you get down there, you know, you've got a problem. 
uh, in this city. They do not speak English. I said, I think some of them might be bilingual. Well, these two ladies were down there. They were into the course. They were course facilitators in this big city. As I'm getting ready to come down there, they're contacting all the groups. And the Holy Spirit, J.C. Central, arranged 19 gatherings on 19 consecutive days. There were no conflicts. There were no two course facilitators that wanted the same day. But it was a big city. So I was mostly in taxi cab rides, driving around, letting the Holy Spirit, Jesus, speak through me. People lighting up. People crying. And it was like revivals. We might as well have been in revivals. People crying, healings, people running around, all very orchestrated. And these three people who came with me going through a lot of healing too. Because we, yeah, you know how they put Jane, Jesus uh, or uh, Joseph and Mary in a manger because they didn't have room at the end. Well, we got down there and the first family to host us didn't have room in their house. So they put us out in their garage. Well, the garage had some like old gasoline cans, motorcycles, kerosene. And we're in the top part of the garage where all the fumes go up. And it's summertime in Buenos Aires. It's wintertime in Indiana, summertime down there. So it, it would get up over 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. We would be like, we'd have to flee our sleeping places. And at nighttime, we'd be all be up there and 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 my friends, you know, were all like, and I said, this is cool. Just accept what's given. I'm... How do you think I got down here? <laughs> I didn't have a plan. What's a little sweat? In fact, I would be, I was out one time with a taxi cab driver and the economy had collapsed down there. So all these people had been lawyers, doctors, teachers. They were driving cabs, having a fun time trying to communicate with me. Most of them, we, we could communicate even though I didn't know Spanish. We were laughing and some of them could talk because they were well-educated. They could Cab drivers know they were doctors and lawyers driving taxis, so we could talk. And then one time, I just got day after day, just got into this joy, like I was a twig in the river, and Jesus was using me and providing everything. And one day, I was in a taxi cab, and his air con- there was no air conditioning in the car. It was maybe ninety degrees, and so I had my window rolled down. And one of these big buses came by. You know, some of the buses. Instead of the top exhaust, they have the side exhaust. And I remember sitting there, and I was in such glee and joy. And my window was rolled down, and this big bus came down. And then when the light turned green, it went. I'm telling you, black soot came in like this. And I had such a smile on my face. I was just in such joy that I just, I loved the black soot. I even... I even could welcome the black soot in the face because I was so lit up. Why? Because I was surrendered over. Why? Because I was in my purpose. I was in my calling. I was in my joy. I was right where I was meant to be in all of time and space, doing right what I was supposed to be doing, and Jesus was moving the puppet. And therefore, my happiness was not circumstance-dependent. I wasn't complaining what what pollution you have. I was enjoying the black soot even. I mean, I did that in China when we first went to China before the Olympics. It was so gray and it was so dark. And when they picked us up at the airport to take us home, we were driving in the car in Beijing. And it was like thick and dark. Kind of like L.A. can get very thick and dark. And then the the, the one in there was saying, David, I just I just have to apologize for our city. I just feel so bad um, that this is so gray and it's, here you are to shine the light in China and, you, and, and I just have to apologize for the gray skies uh, and the pollution. And I said, what? I'm, so I started blowing kisses. I said, I love gray. <laughs> Blow the kisses to the gray. And they're talking pollution. Blow the kisses. Because it's all a state of mind. Everything is a state of mind. There's, there's nothing that, unless you believe it's so. And when you forgive, you give up all the beliefs of everything in the world. And you just, you're in the joy. And so, 
that's how the Argentina thing started. That was in 2003. And then invitations from all over the world, many, 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 started like decades of traveling, traveling. We even, I was saying the other day, we, we were in China at a hotel one time, and we just finished a 360-degree... We went all the way around the world. We were in a China hotel, and we were praying, and I said, Francis, are you hearing what I'm hearing? We're supposed to book a round-the-world trip. And we had just <laughs> finished a completely round-the-world trip. We're in this hotel, and she's like, yeah, I feel it. And we started, we had invitations and everything, and Francis, that day, got on the internet and booked a series of one-way tickets all around the world to all the spots where we had invitations. But for us, that wasn't unusual. People would think, that's a bit radical after you've just finished around the world to book another one. But for us, it was like, listen, follow. It's JC Central. It's Jesus is pulling the strings of all the characters and he's orchestrating everything and the only difference is when you're in alignment with that presence, you can feel it's all out of your hands and it's all part of a perfect plan and it's all perfectly divinely orchestrated and nothing is out of place. Nothing is out of place at all. When you're not in alignment, it's a struggle. It can, this world can seem like hell. Forget about eternal fires and burning in the fires this perceptual fragmented world of struggle every day and then struggle the next day and struggle the next day, it's depressing, it's stressful, it's what you would expect from hell <laughs> without the flames. And now if you notice going on in California and now today I just saw Sydney and, and the whole coast of, um, it's just the beginning, it's springtime, it's just heading for summer and the whole coast of... Um, Australia is up in flames, huge flames, bushfires just going everywhere. And so, but this world, as long as you hold on to the horizontal perspective, then that's, that's what you would get from the attempt to deny love. This world is the denial of love, and yet it only takes a tweak in your mind to, to see it differently. And that's really what we're talking about. Just That's why guidance is so important to us, because it's our life connection, it's our connection to eternal life is, is following that guidance. Yeah, because uh, I think in the past also um, people ask, how are you, uh, that's actually one of the questions we hear a lot. How are you, what are you sustained by if you don't live for money? If you don't work for money, then how? What is sustain you? Is that donations? Is that anything? And I have to say, f from a real um, place, I would say it's guidance that sustains us. It, it's really not um, money, actually. Even guidance provides absolutely everything. Why is that? Because guidance is connecting us to a, a way of thinking that is completely abundant. And it's abundant in everything. You know, before I, I uh, left, wrap up my life and my um, life in, in Australia, my mother actually asked me all these questions. She said, how are you going to have money for the rest of your life? You're still young. What if you get sick? You, what about your life insurance? What about your medical insurance? Are you going to have insurance? No. What about you get get sick I don't know I mean in that way of thinking I was scared back then because that's the way I, I, I grew up to think as well that's the way but there is no answer in that way of thinking because in that way of thinking there is you know the body is, is this fragile thing and needs to be sustained needs to be sustained by food, it needs to be sustained by pills. It will get sick for reasons that you don't understand. It will get old and it will die. And you need a lot of money to, to, to get comfortable. You would get a lot of money to not be in pain, basically. That's the assumption. So I would say right now that what has really shifted, do I know? Yes. What is... What is the knowing is that 
in a state where we can truly live with the spirit, there is no sickness in that thinking, and there is no lack in that thinking. So the question of what if you get sick, what if you run out of money, that kind of question don't exist in this, in this realm of thinking. It's a hypothetical. It is a you hypothetical. You start to think everything in the future is an as if. As if what? As if fear is real. <laughs> That's, that would be the, if you could take all these questions and put them in the one pile. As if fear is real. Now, here's my future question. And we're being shown the as if part. The hypothetical part is, the, is how the ego made the world. It's a, this whole world doesn't have any reality, but it is as if the separation happened as if the fall from grace is real, as if the fall from God is true. Now, and then the question comes in, but what if the first part, if you learn to trust the guidance, and the guidance was showing you that that's not real, it's not true that you fell from grace, it's not true that the ego is real, it's not true that fear has a real cause. God didn't create fear. Why would a God of love create fear? You know, that's a, that's a big stretch. In this world, we get, we get babies from mom and dad and procreation. We get apples from apple trees. We get oranges from orange trees. We get pears from pear trees. We get fear from love. That doesn't seem to follow. I think that, that fruit has rolled from the, a different tree. <laughs> not from divine love. And so when we align with it, this hypothetical world of projection starts to shift so, so much so that you just draw forth witnesses of that love, support, generosity, abundance. It's kind of like the, some of you might have read the books or you might have watched the movie The Secret. They call it sometimes the miracle of manifesting. Sometimes it's called the law of attraction. All the law of attraction is doing is like describing an aspect of the mind of like using the power of thought to bring into form a, a particular wish or whim or desire. It, it's the only value of the law of attraction or the only value of the secret is to show you the power of your mind. It's not going to get you back to heaven. What makes you think you would know what would be best <laughs> If you're asleep and dreaming and deluded <laughs> and you forgot your true identity, what makes you think you even would know what to manifest? What would bring you eternal happiness and peace? So in the end, you know, I had students back in the 1990s and I said, uh, I said, you really want to do a workshop where nobody shows up? Just do one on the impossibility of manifesting. I'm living in an age where it seems to be the Christian churches are talking about do this and pray this for God and, and feel the material abundance of God and God will show you with the material abundance in your life that you are in divine favor with the Lord. I'm teaching the impossibility of divine favor with the Lord in terms of materiality. I'm teaching the impossibility of manifesting. And and then they were the students were laughing. They were I said you want, you want more topics to, to do a workshop where nobody will show up? I said, do one called Healing the Pleasure. People don't want to heal their pleasure. <laughs> Nobody's going to show up for that. <laughs> heal the pleasure? God, that sounds terrible. What, what are you, want a Trappist monk or something? <laughs> sounds pretty trapping to me. But what I'm saying is, the whole manifesting thing its only value is to show you the power of the mind, but then peace of mind is what we want. We want a peace that passeth the understanding of the world, as it says in the Bible. We want to be taken into a state of mind that is invulnerable, that has the strength of God with it, where we are untouched by any perception of the world. Jesus says in the, in the teacher's manual, he says, patience is natural for those who trust. 
No outcome already seen or yet to come can cause them fear. That's a really cool line. Patience is natural to those who trust. No outcome already seen, that's the past, or yet to come can cause them fear. Because you get to the point where you see it's a present decision. You're not here to, to change the world. You're not here to manifest. You're not here to try to... I mean, I did say the other day, I said, um, I said Sedona is, to me is kind of like the new age capital of the world. And then on the way back yesterday to eat, to eat lunch, the first sign I saw on the side of the road was two big letters... Two big words, new age and Jesus. It's like, I'm like, okay, all right, I see. But, but the new age, if you got under the new age, much of what's off or distorted about the new age is just one simple thing. It's called the belief that you can create your own reality. And sometimes people say to me, well, that's what the Course is, right? It's you create your own reality. I said, oh, absolutely not. The Course is nothing about you. The Course says God is the creator of reality. And you can but accept your reality that was created for you. You can but accept yourself as the Christ, which is the reality that God created. But you can't create your own reality. That's, that's another miscreation. So in one sense, the entire New Age movement, and, and the Course is sometimes, uh, I hear a lot of Christians or even fundamentalist Christians that will say, the Course of Miracles, oh yeah, that's just New Age. It is not new age. It has it has nothing to do with the new age. It has nothing to do with create your own reality. That would be a problem because create your own reality, which is like a core teaching of the new age, is what Jesus calls the authority problem. That the author of reality is God. God creates in spirit. So even the stuff about co-creators with God and manifest an abundant life and form that God blesses, no, 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 no. None of it is true. I, I probably, to the New Age movement, I'm like the Antichrist. Like, oh, hell, David showed up. <laughs> he started wiping away. And there's a lot of spin-offs of the Course. Uh, Course of love. Does the course of love have the same teachings of a course in miracles? No. No. This is not about embodying love. Is a course of love an extension of a course in miracles? No. The course of love is a pathway for, for many people to find that starts to resonate. You know, like some of us might have resonated with with uh, like humanistic psychology. Everybody's good inside. Take responsibility for your own mind and your own thoughts. There are so many pathways of the world, but you might say the course is kind of like the end of the road. The course itself says this course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is far beyond what can be taught. Now, why would the author of a book that comes right out and says this course does not aim and teaching the meaning of love, for that is far beyond what could be taught. It aims at removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. Those who work with Course of Love, for example, simply haven't gone into the state of mind that I'm talking about. They don't have the discernment yet. The Course of Love is not an extension of A Course of Miracles. It's, a, it's preschool. Is, it, is there something wrong with The Course of Love? Not at all. Wow, there are people that will find their way into the inroads of spiritual awakening through Course of Love. And I've met, I know Mari Perone, I've met, we spoke at the same conference down in, uh, in Las Vegas. And what I'm saying is, way of mastery, it's, it, it's a step. It's like, it's like a, taking a step on a ladder and, and that will serve itself. There are, in fact, there are like five versions now of A Course in Miracles why would Jesus need five versions for something? <laughs> he didn't. There is resistance to the practical applications of the teaching of the first one. <laughs> and therefore the second one is, I can do it a little bit better. And the third one is, no, actually a little more better. The fourth one is, no, a little more better. And then this one, and then no, a little more better. And now we have camps of people. 
Well, I study number one. Well, number one is not it. No. Number two is it. Number five is it. No, you kidding me? Number four is it. You've read number four? If number four is it. It's like this old show that had uh, Orson Bean and Kitty Carlisle. Some of you might have seen there was a show that was called To Tell the Truth. And they'd all line up, and they're all there with their microphones, and they'd say, my name is so-and-so. And then they'd, my name is so-and-so. My name is so-and-so. And my name is so-and-so. Well, so we have, we're going to play To Tell the Truth today with The Course in Miracles. Okay, who are you? My name is Helen Shuckman, and I am the scribe of A Course in Miracles. Thank you. Okay, and who are you? My name is Jesus of Nazareth, and I am the author of A Course in Miracles. Okay, and who are you? I am Jesus of Palestine. <laughs> you may laugh, but when the Course in Miracles got into copyright controversy, Ken was saying it was Jesus of Palestine. Endeavor Academy was saying, no, it's Jesus of Nazareth. This, this, you may laugh at this little to tell the truth thing, but I've lived through it. <laughs> I've lived through all these years. And so, and then they have a fourth seat there, and it's an empty seat. There's just a voice. <laughs> There's just a voice, not even lips, no, not even a person, just a voice. And it says, I am the Holy Spirit, and I am the author <laughs> of A Course in Miracles. Okay, okay, pan over there. There's nobody there, but we are hearing an audible voice, like Francis heard, coming from the fourth chair. So we've got Helen, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Palestine, and uh, the voice with no form. Now, the Course is a book, and books are what? Matter. And the Course has words in it. And what does Jesus say in the Course about words? He said they're... They're symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So, what is the answer to a question of who is the author of the Course in the sense that to author the book would have to be... The, the book is part of the projection of the world. So, actually, the ego projected the book <laughs> and the ego projected all the bodies and the... Uh, the mic's going to go out on me now. The ego doesn't like this when I get too deep. Uh, but the, it's all a projection. And, and of course, the truth is it can't be found in a book. You know, it can't be described or explained. So, in the end, who authored the Course? We look at our panel. Jesus says, remember I said, God is the author of reality. And reality is spirit. And your reality is spirit. So God is the author of spirit. That's what you should be interested in. Using everything in form as your opportunity for forgiveness. To release whatever meaning you throw onto that book or any book. Course of Love, Way of Mastery, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, the Koran. No, you want to forgive all the meaning that was given to all the words, all the meaning that was given to the scriptures, all the meaning that was given to all the images, and come wholly with empty hands unto the Lord thy God. You are destined for the I am presence because that is who we are, is the I am presence. Can the I am presence shrink down into a book? No. <laughs> Why? It's prior to time. What did Jesus teach us? Before Abraham was, I am. Before history was, I am. This is about a letting go, a forgiveness process of bringing all the scraps of fear in our mind to the light of truth and surrendering and saying, I'm happy to be wrong about this fearful concept, this idea. And all these questions about who wrote what and Who's the real one and who's the fake one and what's, will the real Jesus stand up? Will the real author of A Course in Miracles stand up? What is it that can eliminate the question that we're so concerned about words? 
there are times when people have asked me, but, but David, the words seem like they're important. And I say, well, they are symbols that the Holy Spirit can use for a while. But what is the medium of the miracles that will set our mind free? Jesus doesn't say words are the medium of miracles. Jesus says prayer is the medium of miracles. And that's why we're talking about guidance. That's why we're giving you examples. That's why we're not taking sides on issues. That's why we could actually care less <laughs> about, about issues. They asked me, are you political, David? I, I can't even ask, answer that question. I mean, wh what does that even mean? Uh, because why would I want to take a side or a stance or a st on an issue that is, is itself a projection? When the Course in Miracles fell into this copyright controversy some years ago where they was like, there was actually seven lawsuits going on around the Course in Miracles at the same time. Seven lessons. I lived through this period because I was traveling around sharing the good news and I would go to, to Course and group, group meetings, conferences and everything. People would run up to me and they would say, who's right? And I'd say, what do you mean, who's right? And they'd say, well, who's right in the copyright issue? And I say, what do you mean, who's right in the copyright issue? And they say, which side do you take? And I said, which book are you reading? <laughs> There's nothing. There's nothing in the course that says we should take sides in the world. And what is politic? But politics is taking sides of about unreal issues. That's pretty twisted. And yet, everyone has to follow their guidance based on what they believe. Like Marianne, for example, I was talking to Judy Scutch, who's the publisher of A Course in Miracles. We were having lunch a while back, and, and somebody brought up the topic at the table, and, and she said, well, Marianne called me on the phone, and Marianne said, I keep getting this prompt that I'm supposed to run for president. And... And so Judy listened, and Marianne said, it, it won't go away. Like, I tried to just, no, 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 no. But she said to Judy, I really feel like I'm guided to run for president. Again, the guidance of the Spirit must filter through the belief system. The, the, the belief system determines the world. That's what quantum is. What you perceive is what you believe. And to the extent you have beliefs in time and space, to the extent you have beliefs in victims or victimizers or issues and so on and so forth, the spirit will still, still, still be practical and will still come through your mind into something that can bring a blessing based on what you currently believe. Not that that current belief has anything to do with truth. Not that that current belief has anything to do with reality. But that current belief is what you're dealing with at the moment. It's where you believe you're at in terms of time and space. And isn't it gracious and loving? In fact, the atonement is what Jesus calls the first miracle and the last miracle and all the miracles in between. And Jesus says the atonement operates at all levels. So while the sleeping mind believes there's all these levels, you know, personal, psychic levels, interpersonal levels, neighborhood levels, global levels, intergalactic levels, you know, <laughs> there could be a lot, of, a lot of levels in there. The, the atonement operates at all levels. It's working at all levels. And you know what that means to me? J.C. Central is in charge. <laughs> J.C. Central is using all of the images just in perfect divine order. You can't see the divine order until you reach the top of the... <laughs> The mountain, until you're, until you're right there with J.C. and you're like watching the whole thing going, masterful plan, exquisite, not a single thing out of place. From the highest perspective, all things work together for good. But we must be practical at just feeling the feelings we feel, experiencing whatever we're experiencing, whether they're fears, doubts, or whatever, and turning to that presence and that love inside us and saying, guide me. This is what I'm dealing with now. If I'm dealing with a fear, a doubt, anything, any emotion. And that's why I feel like 
I've been able to seemingly, the body's traveled the world many times over, but I don't really care about that either. Jesus says in the Course, God's Son is not a traveler through time and space. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's uh, good to keep in mind with, with all this seeming travel. As the Bible, Jesus said, um, the birds of the air have their nest, and the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was simply saying 2,000 years ago, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. He wasn't identified with the, the, the Jesus character, he was, he was aligned with the I am presence. So what this is, is we just teach follow guidance and always remember you have to bring the illusions to the truth. Don't try to bring God's love into form. Don't try to bring eternal light and love into form. This is an error that Course of Love uh, flickers with. Don't try to bring divine love into form because it doesn't work that way. You have to bring the illusions to the truth. You have to bring the darkness to the light for the darkness to disappear. If you attempt to bring divine love and light into the world, you will fall into many different traps. One of them is called spiritualizing matter. There was a beautiful teacher called Mary Baker Eddy who, who taught through her book Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures and basically what she taught was there is no mind in matter. There is no life, there is no truth, there is no substance, and there is no intelligence in matter. That's fitting with what I'm talking about, about the mind. Everything I've talked about here, yesterday and today, is that the world was made to keep you mindless, to forget that you are mind. We don't have to skip over, does Jesus talk about feelings and emotions in A Course in Miracles? Yes, he does. Does he talk about cognition and thinking? Yes, he does. Does he talk about belief? Yes, he does. Does he talk about perception? The gross perceptual world? Yes, he does. Does Jesus talk about desire in A Course in Miracles? Yes, he does. He's even given me a map of the mind and how all those aspects work together in terms of causation, in terms of what causes what. That's very helpful. I've been publishing this stuff and this stuff has been on the internet for many years and it's been translated to Mandarin, it's been translated to Spanish, I don't know, there's maybe seven or eight languages, but we're talking about the living presence of Christ. And I'm talking about sharing and extending to go past the level confusion. What is level confusion? You know, Jesus talks about level confusion in A Course in Miracles. It's simply believing that the world of form has causation. It, in physics, this takes the form of Newtonian physics, not quantum physics, but Newtonian physics, for every action, there's a reaction. Has everyone heard that one? It, it's, it influences every single teaching in this world. If you went to a university and you, you studied um, cooking and auto mechanics and uh, chemistry and urban planning and engineering and, you know, all the things you can take when you go to a university, what do all those uh, different schools have in common? False cause and effect. Engineering is the same as if you were taking, learning your culinary skills of baking. They're every single thing in the university is touched with false cause-effect teachings. So these teachings are so spectacular because they bring everything back to your mind. Very simply, you start to come back into the projector room, you come back to your mind, and then you start to realize to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden or it will obscure your learning. And that's what now I feel like when somebody just asked me when they did an interview with me in, um, in Holland, they said, 
so are you a Course in Miracles teacher? And I don't, I don't even agree to that <laughs> label anymore. People can say whatever they want. But it's, a, it's just living presence. It's just the moment. Does this living presence have a, a joyful encounter with everything and everyone? Yes. I'm on a, a, a boat or a plane. I'm sitting next to an atheist or an agnostic or a Hindu or a Christian or whatever. I have a joyful encounter because I don't put the words in the mouth. I've had so many holy encounters with what the world calls atheists that I think if they ever had a convention called Atheist Unite, they might invite me to be a speaker. <laughs> I could get invited, I do get invited to churches, synagogues, ashrams, and I think if Atheists Unite ever found out and they heard me, <laughs> I, I show movies like I showed this movie in the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment I have, I show this movie that has Bill Maher in it. It's called Religulous. It's it's a combination between religion and ridiculous. The, the title <laughs> of the movie is Religulous. And, and I use it because a lot of atheists, they have trouble believing in a punishing God. They have trouble believing in, a, in an anthropomorphic God who has all these human emotions. The fear of God and zapping tribes and everything. And so I'm talking to the atheists and I'm going, I totally relate. <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't believe in that either. I don't see that as the real God, but I don't even have to talk about God when I'm talking to an atheist. We just have a joyful, happy encounter, the same encounter I have with, with the Buddhist, with the Christian scientist, with the Hindu, with whatever. There's a part in the, in, in, I think it's in the psychotherapy pamphlet, this is an amazing idea from Jesus where Jesus says, Belief in God is unnecessary, for God can be but known. Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying that line? Belief in God is unnecessary, for God can be but known. So Jesus simply merged with that I am presence, and he was friendly with everyone. He loved everyone. Even when he got a little firm sometimes, it was he was trying to help them to see the friendliness, the joy, and to re release their theology. You know, because he wasn't here to try to establish some kind of real tight theology. You must believe this or you'll go to hell. Jesus never was teaching that. Now, he did occasionally get invited to the synagogues where he would say things like, um, before Abraham was, I am. That did not go over well with the <laughs> Sanhedrin that did not go over well with the Sadducees. They, read, they were ready to strangle him. Like, how dare you come into the synagogue and talk about Abraham <laughs> in that way? To them, Abraham was their linear time father from many centuries ago. And Jesus was saying, before Abraham was, I am. He was teaching the unreality of time uh, in the synagogue, and that did not go over very well. But... For us, our, our part is not to be crucified. <laughs> Isn't that nice? We, we don't have any part in the crucifixion. We have nothing to do with it. Our part is the resurrection. And how do we teach the resurrection but by our joy? But by our happiness? But by our demonstration? We don't even have to have fancy words. But if we go around living happy, living joyful, living free, oh, you think that, well, that does a lot because we teach with our attitude. It's our attitude that's the teacher. And even with the words, the words should be in alignment with that attitude. In other words, I have many people who come to live with me. As soon as I got happy, like in the early 90s, then I had all these people wanting to live with me. I'm not interested in starting a community. I'm not interested in starting a movement. I'm interested in the present moment and <laughs> being happy. That, and actually, that's all that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in anything else at all. And yet, when people want to come and live with you, then things start to 
happen. It's the quantum world where Jesus is just using, arranging, rearranging perception and everything. But you can't ever stay in the awareness of that quantum field or that happy dream as long as you put any concern into anything of this world. As soon as you start to put your mind energy back into the form, that's an idol. Then you've got something to defend. Then you've got something to protect. So really, that's been, for me, the joy is I collaborate with, with all kinds of people in, all over the world just because I'm in a state of joy. And that's how I feel the collaboration. Jesus brings us together. When we went to Mexico, we didn't know anything. We don't know Spanish. I don't know the culture. I don't know anything about Mexico. I know the name Mexico. I know the James Taylor song, Mexico. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> oh, Mexico, never really been, but I sure like to go. Oh, Mexico, guess I'll have to go now. Okay, I know the Mexico song <laughs> from James Taylor, but I'm pretty clueless, actually. The most I think of Mexico is I fly down there to sit by the ocean and meditate and look out. But now... Jesus takes us down to Mexico. We meet all these Mexican angels. A family adopts me. It's like, not literally, but I mean, like, lovingly. This family in Monterey loves me. David! They take me into their family as if I've been in the family my whole life, even though they just met me. And then we meet angels everywhere. Lupita a real estate angel, we meet a financial angel, Caesar. Remember the Bible? Render unto Caesar, that which is Caesar, and unto God, that which is God. It's like Jesus is just playing all the time, playing, 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 playing. Even with the characters he brings, you know, he's like, ha, ha, ha. Do you like that one? Ha, 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 ha. What do you think about that one? We're just like, yeah, you what, I got a great sense of humor. You're having a blast arranging time and space just to show us that we're free. We're free in God. And Jeffrey's giving us a yeah. signal. <laughs> I like what you just said. As long as you don't have any investment in this world, then you can truly live that state of happiness. But we still have a three-hour session this afternoon, and I think there's still a lot of time for even more questions and practical examples. So... Yeah, we'll get into that more this afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>